Gig Gab, the podcast for working musicians, episode 246 for Monday, March 2nd, 2020. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians, struggling musicians, any kind of musicians. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in San Jose, California, Paul Kent. Hey, Paul. How you doing, man? I'm good. Good. I good. think good. Good. Yeah. You know, good. Mar- March is a weird month. It's like you can kind of see spring over the over the horizon, but you still got a, enough taste of winter where you're kind of stuck in it. I mean, Tell we me have a good calorie. Yeah. Well, yeah, for you, it's even more extreme, but we had a crazy run of like high 70, 80 degree weather here in February, which got everybody thinking winter was over, but it's sure. back down to, into the, you know, forties ish is about as cold as we get here. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. cooler here, but no, no outdoor gigs. All right. Well, I um I didn't I didn't play at all this weekend because it was cold and I stayed inside. But um we as I mentioned we're you know kind of in full force recording a bunch of new fling songs. I don't know how many we will actually record this time, but I think in our we use Trello to manage all that stuff, which is mm-hmm. which is actually great. You know we have one cool card. Tool. Yeah, we have one card per song, and and everybody can have comments and links, and it keeps it all sort of uh, you know compartmentalized, which is good. Um, that, as far as this weekend goes, that's about the only part of this that was working for me, uh, was that Trello remained stable and alive. Mm-hmm. Um, I decided to, uh, to mic the drums differently this time. The last time we did recordings, I, I mean, I played the drum parts, but it was mostly just like, all right, you know, let, I'll just play a part. Were there any make mistakes? No. Okay, good to go. And I used four mics, kick snare and two overheads. And it was like, yeah, that's fine. And to be fair, those recordings came out great. But this time I wanted to, A, make the drum parts a little more intentional and and kind of craft the fills around the vocals and, and be more thoughtful about that, which is which that part's going fine. Um, and I thought, well, you know, why not record uh, cl- and close mic the toms and all of that stuff? Well, that changes things. And uh, and I've actually started to get somewhat of a decent drum sound. But uh, I spent hours here in the studio yesterday fighting with like logic. And I, I, I'm sure it was all my fault, of course. But man, like I would I would do a couple of takes and I thought I had things right. And then I would come back to the computer and, you know, it would only rec- if I did three takes in a row, it would only have recorded two of them. I was like, well, where's the third one? It's just not there. Gone, you know, not recorded at all. And and I'm I, and logic's great. like I've never had that problem with logic before, but I was doing some weird things. Adding microphones to the drum group starts to get things, make things a little wonky. You know, I probably shouldn't have done sure. that in in the same recording session. And and then, of course, I'm realizing because we're using it, because I'm using close mics on the toms, I'm using far less of the overheads. And the the last time I just, like I said, had kick snare and then the overheads. And I think I was using most of the high end of the snare was coming from the overheads. Well, now that I'm using less overheads, I am now certain I need to put a mic underneath the snare drum to get some of that sizzle out of the drum, the snare sound, because I'm getting way too much of the tone of the drum uh, which is fine out of the top mic, but yeah, I need to add Not sizzle. Yeah, yeah, I need some of that. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's a learning process, but boy, was yesterday frustrating. You know, I, I it was just like, man, and I had a couple of really good takes that I liked and I was going to kind of craft a part together. That's one thing that Logic is amazing at is stitching together multiple takes. You, I mean, you literally just drag across the, you know, you pick sort of one take that is your let's call it the foundation. It doesn't really matter, but you start with one. And then if you say, Oh, okay, well that fill and drums are notoriously the worst thing to have to punch in and out because you've got, you know, you got to do your crossfades just perfectly. Otherwise things start sounding really weird. Well, Mm -hmm. logic, just that part of logic works amazingly well. 
Uh, so you just swipe with your mouse like you say, OK, well, this measure or this beat or whatever, you know, this fill I want to come from, you know, that take, not this take. And you just sure. swipe across with your mouse and it automatically builds the comp track for you based on that, like instantly in uh -huh. real time. And the crossfades are perfect. I mean, certainly if I if I, you know, do a swipe in the middle of a, a fill, I could make it sound very bad. You know, like how did the how did the drummer make his hands do that? You know, but but by and large, if it's if I'm keeping time well enough and and, you know, I just grab it like in the middle of a groove or something, it's it's complete. You can't tell at all. It's, it does a really good job with it. Very cool. I just wish I had all the takes that I had recorded. You know, that would have been and nice. So you have no idea there's no tech note or anything as to what is causing this glitch? I you know I'm sure I caused it. Like I said, I have in order for all of those um, in order for you to be able to do what I was just talking about, comping all the takes together, you have to kind of link all the tracks of the mm -hmm. of the particular instrument, in this case, the drums. So I've got what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mics on the drums. There will be eight because I'm going to put one under the snare. And that was my problem is I started this with just four mics and and then added three more. And I think that process of adding three more really confused logic in terms of like what to link together and all that. So I, I, I just need to kind of wipe the slate clean, but I, I was, you know, it, it, I, I don't want to say never before, but perhaps never before, but certainly rarely do I get up from the drums and then want to hit something. Um, usually the drums sort of, you know, kind of take that <laughs> away and I'm not a violent guy anyway. Like I, you know, I, I, I very rarely have the urge to hit anything. It's just not a thing for me, but but yeah. I was I was bummed. It's really what it was. <laughs> I was just I was emotionally tender after uh, spending a couple hours, maybe three hours over here and just like coming out with. I mean, I came out with one track that was like, you know, or I, I stitched together one take. It was like, yeah, that's OK. But the snare doesn't sound the way like I want it to. So I, I got to throw it all away. And that's just sort of frustrating. But and how much of the process does the whole band participate in? Like, how much do other people comment on what they want the snare to sound like? Does everybody sit together as you do mixing sessions? Do you master yourself? So many questions. So many questions. Yeah. So, I, you know, the, the nice part is we get to do whatever we want. Um, the last time we did this, uh, I think I I don't think anybody was here when I tracked the drums. Uh, but mixing generally, well, the last time we did it, Russ, I would maybe do a, a rough mix. Guys would record their parts usually at home. So we would all record separately um, and then and then, you know, assemble all the tracks in one place. We did them here last time uh, where, you know, we just kind of import all the tracks. We all play to the same click or once I have drums out there. When a, you know, a scratch vocal somebody's got or whatever that goes sort of into the queue. So everybody's got that in their in their workstations and can play off of it. And then mm -hmm. and then we sort of layer it all together. Uh, and and last time Russ did most of the mixing. He is it, mixing requires more patience than I'm usually able to apply uh, in order to get it right. Like I'm really good at solving problems like if there's an EQ problem with something or that like that I can dive into because I know when it's solved with a mix, you never quite know when it's finished, you know, and you can sort of overdo it. Mm -hmm. uh, Russ, Russ has the patience for that. So, you know, division of labor, he, he does the mixing. I sometimes am here in the room with him when he mixes, sometimes not. Uh, we certainly don't have all five of us in the room mixing. That wouldn't work. Mastering, it turns out I'm pretty good at because really what's mastering doing? Solving problems, right? You're taking this final mix, a two track mix generally, and, you know, and then just trying to make it sound sweet and nice. And, and I'm I, like EQing things is is something I'm pretty good at. So so I, I did the mastering side of it last time and it came out OK. I mean, I've I've certainly paid people to do it in the past and, and there are lots of people that are way, way better than me at it. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's good enough for for what we were doing. And it's like, yeah, OK, fine. So but but in terms of your question, like, do people have comments about the snare sound or whatever? Absolutely. We all comment on each other's stuff all the way through. Uh, in fact, I had earlier in the week, I had thrown together some drum tracks. Uh, they weren't meant to be finished. It was just like, OK, I've got this stuff here. Here's a very rough mix. Russ had some guitars together. I laid the, on this particular song. I'm singing the, the lead. So I just literally sat here in front of my podcast mic and laid down, you know, one rough track just to have something to, to play around. Uh, and so I, I sent that mix out. And I thought, you know, these guys are going to yell at me. I There's way too much drums on this. Like, 
I, I Russ had start had the song start with a guitar thing, which is how we've always started it. I did a full measure drum fill into the song, and I thought, yeah, okay, these guys are just going to yell at me, but fine, they can hear how the tom sound and all that stuff, and and that's good. And the comment I get back from Russ is, it sounds like you played it kind of safe. I think maybe you you kind of fell prey to the recording alone in a room scenario. He's like, it it needs to have more energy, more you know, like play more. I'm like, hmm. oh, music to my ears. Be more bombastic. You got it. Like that's I know how to do that. So, that's um, funny. but it is. But yeah, we we definitely go back and forth on that. And we, you know, I've said before. I mean, Fling's been around. We've been this lineup for a long time, more than a decade. So we trust each other. You know, we can be pretty um, direct with each other without anybody taking it overly personally or you know anything like that. Usually, I mean, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you know it's like you catch somebody at the wrong time. It's like oh crap, okay. But generally, yeah, it's you know it's all all in the interest of having fun together and, and making a product that we're proud of and that sort of thing. So, cool. Yeah. You played Sounds this good. weekend, man. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get through it. Um, it, like I said, we've got some mixers to talk about. There's a lot of hardware to discuss, but but um. But that that lays some of the foundation. We'll we'll talk about that in future episodes as this project. Sort yeah, of I think that'd be a fun discussion. Because yeah, because I don't understand a lot about that type of stuff. I mean, yeah. I've done it, but um, the nitty gritty and how you do it as a band, and you know how you, like you said, even how you establish that communication, the effort to get the best product. I think that's pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, it is. I will share one thing that I learned last time that that shocked me. I, the bass was a mess. Like just the sound of the bass was a mess in those last recordings. And I'm fighting with it and fighting with it. And like I said, EQ is sort of my thing. And I'm messing with compression and all of that. And finally, you know, I just kept thinking there's just too much low end energy on the bass. And so I'm trying to like rein it in with compression. I was even doing some multi band compression. I'm like, wait a minute. What if I just take the EQ and roll it off at like 100 hertz, like roll off the bass starting at maybe 80 hertz or something and it cleaned it up perfectly. I never would have, like, I mean, I did eventually, but initially I did not think that rolling off low end would, would be the right thing to do with the bass guitar, but it turns out that it is. So, you know, there's things, you got to try crazy things and, and see if they work. So I learned that last time. I'm sure I'll learn more this time. If anybody has any help, though, that you want to send in anything, you've heard something and you're like, Dave, you're missing the point. Feedback at gigabpodcast.com. I'd love to help. <laughs> Yesterday was a rough day. <laughs> Anyway, you played this weekend, my friend? House Rockers played Saturday night. Again, we're not playing that much. We had a rehearsal, our first rehearsal in a while. Yeah. And like I said, we're, you know, we're, we have a new set, basically, you know, that's kind of filling mm. in a part of our repertoire. And it was interesting. Uh, so I'll get to the gig, but real quick, you know, you send guys 13, 14 songs and say, come ready to play. Yeah. And I know, I know the mental um, gymnastics that different people can I know Russ is going to chart everything and be rock solid. Yep. I know, uh, you know, other guys have different degrees of, uh, you know, this exercise. Well, I know we're not going to finish everything this week. So sure. um, I'll wait and see what the other guys have, you know, done. And uh, and I'll be close enough. I can play the song, but, you know, the, the nuances are not down yet or you know, things aren't memorized or, or you know, but, I, you know, I, th- I'm not going to be gig ready. Cause I'm willing to bank. Everybody else isn't going to be gig ready on this. Right. So that's one <laughs> mental that one mental. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it was interesting. Like I said, we've never, we've never done it this way before. It's always been like, here's three songs. You know, I know one of them is going to take more than one rehearsal. Let's try and bang this one out. But I was like, here's a set, you know, come as ready as you can. Let's see where you are. Um, for Nick, because a lot of it is newer music, it was interesting. He actually has to spend a lot of time creating sounds and patches and oh, um, which is, you know, yeah. there's not, you know, and, and that actually took a fair amount of time for him and, and he was quite diligent about it. And all of a sudden the band sounds very, very different. Like we're, we're pretty much a, a grip it and rip it type of band, you know, but not a lot of, not a lot of produced sound to us, but Nick actually went in and for a lot of these newer things, you know, he's created some really interesting sounds and the band just sounded different instantly. That was kind of fun. Um, uh, some of this stuff I'd say of the, of the 13 or 14 songs, four maybe are just about ready to get out. And so, you know, what I did was I, I sent out a note saying, okay, guys, I have six more rehearsals scheduled for the rest of the year here's a plan for all six of them because we know the 14 songs we're working on. So next rehearsal, the four that were close, let's bang them out and get them out of the rehearsal studio and onto the stage. Um, we're going to start these two songs. 
uh, the next rehearsal, I, I think we should be able to finish these two songs. And so just kind of managing time and expectations to kind of affect that mental gymnastics Man, process. You know? That is brilliant. It, you know, so many times I'm not thinking Thank of you. every band that I've ever been in, you know, where it's like, OK, well, we, we just rehearse ad infinitum, right? The, the rehearsal schedule is endless. And so <laughs> we just sort of, you know, let's work on whatever we work on. And and that is not effective if you need to, like, get things done. So your idea of, OK, we have six rehearsals left before we start our, you know, summer, you know, extravaganza, whatever. OK, great. Now let's chop it up. Here's what we do. Maybe leave one rehearsal as overflow because things aren't going to go as planned. Whatever that is like, that's fine. But having that deadline there, what a I, Yeah, I, I'm brilliant, man. I like it. Yeah. So yeah. we're on that path. One second. Oh, yeah. Mr. Kent. Sorry about that. No yeah. problem. Uh, um, so uh, we have a plan now. One of the rehearsals I blacked out as a vocal only rehearsal. I think when you're a band that rehearses every week. You know, it's easy to kind of fall into, well, let's just get together and start playing and see what happens. See what and, happens. But that's not effective. Yeah. That's not a fish. Well, I don't want to say it's not effective. It can be effective for different things. But that's not that's not efficient when you're thinking of it as a project like like this. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing that kicks you into gear for planning is I'm paying for the rehearsal studio. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. That 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 uh, puts a fire under you to be productive and, uh, and efficient with uh, these things. So I like you it. Know, to make sure money out of it so anyway so we had a gig at a at a club we've been at for 15 16 years it's become a great venue for us it's about 40 miles away so we play 75 percent of our gigs 20 miles around right. circumference right right and uh, you know we have our local following and that gig is precious to me because it's a it's a gig that we've had for a long time we've worked very hard to build an audience People tell people it's always packed because of us. The owner loves us because of us. And um, it's uh, it's pretty cool. So we go to this club and, you know, it's like coming home. People come up and, you know, hey, what you playing tonight? And just you know, very warm. The, the bartending staff always has a good night. So they're really, you know, supportive of us and, you know, gets us our drinks. And, you know, it's, it's yeah. just a good situation. And we just had another really good night. It's just... When you build, when you're lucky enough to build those things where everything is tilted in your favor, and there's dancers who are excited from the moment you get down, and the energy is flowing from the moment you get down, and everybody's laughing, everybody's smiling, everybody's having a good time. Those are really precious nights. I don't care whether it's whether it's 25 people or 2,500 people or you know 25,000 people. Yep. When it when it's that vibe that is just fun. When you're throwing and, a party like that. Yeah. When, yeah. And we're a party band. Yeah. That's absolutely. It. Yep. I did. I did reflect on this. We've been on a really good streak, even though we don't see each other this time of year as much as we're going to see each other. Mm. And really, since November, it's been quite a bit less. The gigs that we do have have been remarkably consistent. And I think uh, I, I, I actually sent him a note about this. I think I think a large part of this is Russ is incredibly consistent. He's he's a metronome, you know, from time standpoint, but. He um, his preparation is fantastic and he he is there every night in the same way. Yep. Joe is a great drummer and, you know, one of the most enjoyable rock and roll drummers I have. But we would throw material at him that would be, you know, not his wheelhouse and stuff he probably wouldn't have chosen to play. And, you know, the, the feel, you know, would be Joe's feel to a song. And that um, sometimes can work and sometimes can like the guy who picked the song might be, uh, you know, we're not playing it the way I like it. Sure. And there just is this, there just can be this, um, this energy. Did we find our way to the song or did we not find our way to the song tonight? Yeah. We found our way to the I, song. I right? find, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I have the viewpoint from the drum stool, so I, it's hard for me to abstract that out, but I've definitely found that with bass players, right? Like if, if a bass player, sort of homogenizes every song into his wheelhouse and that's not the wheelhouse of the band. Yes, he's playing, you know, notes that are in the right chord. Yes, he's playing in time, you know, all of that. But if it's not being played the way that I'm used to hearing the song, at least stylistically, that can that can throw things off. I mean, it changes the song. As I always say, though, you know, especially in Fling, you know, but it's true of any band. You run the song, 
You take the the song, you run it through your band, and what comes out the other side is how you play that song. And sometimes it's, you know, it, depending on the, the interests and experience of the players. I don't even want to say talent. It, it, it's mostly like it's not about talent. It's not yeah. about talent. Yeah. It's just experience. It's of feel. The, it's feel. Yeah. Do you do you do you feel this the way that that everybody else in the band wishes you would kind of thing? Well, that's it. Do we do we feel it the same? Yes. Do we feel it the same? That's the right way to say it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And and again, Joe was an is an amazing rock and roll drummer. He makes stone stuff, Beatles stuff. He feels it. He senses it. He lives it. It's in his DNA. Yeah. You know, he, you know, when I play Springsteen with, with Joe, it is a religious thing. When we play, you know, what's tower or when we play um, some of the Stevie stuff, do I do, you know, even, oh, yeah. even I wish, right. You know, a swing is a swing and I Russ is hard, a, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's a hard thing anyway, to get that groove. No, you're totally right. I know what you're saying. Yep. And in the big sense, the point is, is that we have been our, we're in this. It's like a nice warm glove that we're just all laying back in because nice. the grooves and the feels have just been nice every time. There's, you know, there's never that song coming up that I call it because I need to make this guy happy. But I know this guy doesn't really like it. But, you know, you know, there are those those types of songs when you put the set list. This guy wants to play it. It doesn't necessarily go over the best, but, you know, it, it might be the right thing to do. Oh, this guy hasn't sung that for a while. We need to get a repetition in on that. So we all remember the song. All those kind of little subjective decisions I make when I put together our set list. It, we, we just are clicking, you know, for at least six months. And maybe, I, you know, when I said this to Russ, you know, he's been in the band just about two years. Um, um, maybe that's how long it takes. It takes a while, man. Changing out a drummer, um, changing out anybody in the band takes a while. But but the drummer, especially, I think, you know, that like that's at the core of your rhythm section. Everybody's got to lock in with that guy. You can have a, a rhythm guitar player come in and and, you know, two guys in the band ignore him or whatever. I mean, that's not what should happen, but. You know, you can you can sort of downplay that ish. You shouldn't, but you could. You cannot downplay the drummer like that person is going to be playing the drums and it is at many times going to be the most present thing. I don't want to say it's necessarily going to be the loudest thing, but, you know, you're going to he it's percussive, right? You're going to hear that kick and snare. But it's it's more than that. It's time and feel. Correct. It starts with yeah. the drummer, right? Yeah, it is. And, and I think that that's. That's the nature of this comfortable place that we're in is that I know that that's going to be there every single night. That's you know, great. you know, like pocket and groove. It, you, you do less and you get more. Right. It's like, how does it sound so good? But the whole you just feel it. It's the whole all the sound emanating is just synced. You know, collaborative, com compatible, complementary, And all of a sudden, this thing that's greater than the sum of the parts happens and it can happen in any style of music. It's not just groove music, you know, technically it's not just that type of stuff, right. but, but uh, man, to go from, and you know, we are a band where the singers all choose different styles. Nick chooses funk. I choose more rock. Simon likes 80 stuff. I mean, we have, that's one of the great strengths of our band is that we represent different styles, often making it sound like us to great effect. Um, but they are different styles and, and Russ is, you know, that's great. I, and this would be Bernie Band. Your yeah. drummer is the foundation of the band. I don't say this because you're my buddy and you're a great drummer. I say this because, you know, having played with with different groups and different fields and different times, we can say what we want about everything, about who gets the girls, you know, who gets the guys, who, <laughs> yeah, whatever right, it may be. Exactly. Yep. The drums is where it all starts. It's just everything layers on top of the drums. If the drums are wrong, everybody has an opinion. If time is bad, if, you know, we had a drummer once uh, in the early days, he didn't last very long. Every time he did a fill, he sped up mm. and the horn players, it made them crazy because they're reading charts and counting time, you know, more than the rhythm section, which is kind of, kind of just feeling. following. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it made them crazy. And you know, the band just didn't work like guys threatening to quit. I can't play with this guy. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So hail praise to the great drummers, to Joe, to Russ, to you. Music, popular music that moves people, you know, it starts with great rhythm and and uh, and, you know, just that vibe and feel. So Which reminds me, actually. I, you, well, we got a question. And so I 100 percent agree with you, uh, except I disagree with you. I Like, I agree that the 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 driver of the rhythm is the most 
it like it needs to be is the core of your band and in in full electric bands that person is almost always the drummer we could point to the who and say it was pete townsend right but the, uh, you know that's uh, a good point right but but you're right almost always is the drummer now we got a note from someone that we will uh just call mr x who says uh i play acoustic guitar in a three-piece acoustic band there's a percussion player who plays cajon and then there's a singer our percussion player is a drummer at heart so I'm assuming he's used to driving the beat and tempo all the time. This, I imagine, translates over to his cajon playing as well. The predicament that I have is that my guitar playing is very rhythmic and percussive. So a lot of times I feel like the guitar and the cajon are clashing and fighting over who is the driver of the beat, which in turn confuses our singer sometimes mid song. On gigs where we uh, where we can, we form the triangle singer up front in the middle uh, with me, the, the guitar player and the cajon player on either side. We can where we do that. We can kind of mitigate this because the percussion player and I can angle ourselves slightly toward each other so we can communicate better. But then there are those gigs where it's just the three of us in a straight line and makes it difficult to look at each other across the singer's body. It sort of looks distracting, too, whenever one of us leans forward or back just to get some eye contact to communicate something. At first, I thought our internal rhythm perceptions were just not aligned, so we needed to work on being more in sync with each other. So we tried playing with a metronome and click tracks, and we sort of partly fixed the issue, which uh, was great, but still, once we're left to our own without the click, we tend to drift away a little bit, but we're a little more aware now. He says, I'm also trying to scale back on my playing to let the percussion take the lead on the beat more, but sometimes I feel like I don't do justice to the song by playing less, like omitting an upward strum or two or not using a ghost note or whatever. He says... I also have a theory of maybe bringing in a bass player to keep the rhythm more in check, but we haven't tested that yet. The acoustic trio format is sacred to us and we're a little hesitant about adding a fourth. So since Dave, you're a drummer percussion player and Paul, you're a guitar player and you've both played in acoustic stuff. I'm curious to your thoughts. So I have a lot to say about this. I don't know if you want me to start or you, or you want to start, Paul. It, it, let uh, me tee this up and go I'm going to let you go. Yeah. So, so I will say this as a guitar player and especially an acoustic, um, the temptation to treat the acoustic guitar and strumming patterns as rhythm um, is, is obvious. You know, when you're a guitar player, you emote through your guitar playing and often that times, you know, you strum more during more emphatic passages of a song, you know, especially if you have a background playing solo and you want more feel, you know, the temptation is to use the acoustic guitar more aggressively. Um, it works to great effect often. It, to me, it often sounds quite busy. Um, and again, remember, we're talking about drums and guitar here. The question is, is the melody popping out on top of what you're doing. We, you know, you can sort through who can be less busy after that, but you know, the goal is any instrument that's busy uh, or that's, that's clanking against the singer's part. Definitely. You have to look at those parts. So yeah. I understand the desire and I also understand the emotion of being, you know, of playing acoustic and feeling it and really digging in and getting busier with your rhythms or getting louder with your rhythms, those types of things. I, I get that. Um, my intuition on most of these things in the format that, that, uh, Dr. X shares with us, I, I gave him a promotion to a doctor. I like that. Um, oh, that's is, great. Yeah. is, uh, is I, I think, I think percussion sets the rhythm and the guitar has to find his way on top of that. The percussion is the constant, uh, in this format and, uh, and the guitar should find his way to complement percussion. So I, in general, I know that there's Latin styles of music that, sure. that, you know, guitars are quite percussive and those types of things. And, and, you know, in this day and age with loopers and, you know, people using guitars as drums, the, the effort, but if you have a percussionist and they're doing it, and again, if, if the percussionist is too busy, the speaker should, the singer should speak up and, you know, say, I can't, I can't. I can't lay on top of what you're laying down and, and, you know, the band has to solve it that way. But in general, my initial reaction, again, I've not heard Dr. X's band. Sure. And I don't right. know. Yeah, they're, it's they're, different. They're That's true. Yeah. 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 But I, I would say in general, in, in, in building something, I would start with percussion and then, 
you know, see how how a vocal part lays on top of that. And a guitar as a rhythm instrument is even in that format, which is a you know wonderful format for you know creating vibe and creating you know delivering music. I think that the the guitar player's role is to find his way to sit on top of a rhythm, a foundation that a percussionist provides. And I'll shut up for that. Uh, I'm not going to say that you're wrong, um, but I might imply that with what I'm about to say, Uh, because every band is different. You have to find what works for you. I entered the acoustic uh, trio format as an add on. Okay, I don't I'm trying to think if before Monkey Fist and it's been like 10 years that I've been playing with Monkey Fist before them. I don't think I'd ever really done any like serious acoustic things that were just like an acoustic act because I played with Monkey Fist before I joined Chafed, which was the electric version of uh, Ch- Monkey Fist was the acoustic version of Chafed. But anyway, uh, so Monkey Fist had been playing John and Jimmy had been playing for about a year, let's say. So they had their stuff down. Like they knew each other in terms of how to play. They were doing three hour gigs. Like they had everything they needed. And then they asked me to join uh, it for a couple of gigs. It's turned out to be more than that, obviously. But uh, they asked me to join, to bring in some harmonies and some percussion. So, uh, but before that first gig, I never had a rehearsal with him. I had never even sang with Johnny before until we were on stage together, uh, which was interesting. So they gave me a list of songs and I, I just listened to them like, you know, uh, on repeat. And this was in the pre iPad days. So I had to just learn the, the vocals and learn the harmony. So I was mostly focused on that because I figured, well, I can just play along with anything. Uh, that's fine. And like, and they've already got it together. Like they don't need me, you know, cause they're already doing it. And, and so I went into that first gig, very apprehensive, as you might imagine, like, okay, I got to figure out how to blend harmonies with this guy live. Uh, I've got to, you know, figure out how to play with Jimmy and lock in with him live and we got to be entertaining in the process. So we got to, you know, we have, and and it was a big, you know, fairly big gig for an acoustic thing. Uh, that first gig we played. So there was a lot going on, but I think that was the perfect introduction for me because from my standpoint and, and that, and I was playing congas at that gig. I had two congas set up. So uh, two congas and a vocal mic and, and some mics on the congas, obviously uh, to just to help reinforce things. But, um, and now I mostly play with my, my cajon, my pitch slap cajon, which is great. Highly recommended. Um, that first gig, I followed Jimmy and I realized very quickly that in at least in the acoustic formats that I played. And I would agree that, that this was the same when I played that, you know, acoustic show with you at the winery a couple of years ago, a few years ago, whatever it was that the guitar player is the drummer, the guitar player in, in, in that the guitar player drives the rhythm and it, because the guitar player is driving so much of everything. There's the chord structure. Like you said, there's locking in with the singer. Oftentimes, you know, in an acoustic format, the guitar player is the singer. You know, it's not always, but a lot of times that that's what happens. That's not how monkey fist is usually. But um, but I, I really feel like in that acoustic format, the 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 guitar should be the thing driving. And and I loved it. Like once I realized that, oh, I don't have to drive the bus here. That's not actually my job. I'm here to provide like accompaniment for that. Now and certainly there are there are songs specific songs where that's not the case where I'm actually driving the bus and and there's moments in songs where we'll shift back and forth but by and large Jimmy drives the bus and if Jimmy speeds up I follow him and if he slows down I follow him and I mean you know again sometimes we push and pull we've been playing together for a decade we you know it, it's it's less uh, def- it's less distinct now it sort of becomes one. But I really feel like the guitar player drives the bus in the acoustic format. That that's how I approach it as a drummer, uh, and and that is not how I approach you know playing in in a in a full electric band when I'm sitting behind a drum kit. I it's like nope, I'm gonna I have to be the one. Hopefully everybody can hold it together. But if we can't, I am going to be the one that will hold it together because who else can be? You, you know, um, in an acoustic act, I think that question is answered. Who else can be? The guitar player can and should be. If things start to fall apart, follow the guitar player. Um, They're driving the bus. Let's take this a different way. So um, 
we're probably being too broad and we're just talking about how in general bands should act and, you know, mm. people's roles in bands. But I would say take a song like me and Julio down by the schoolyard, right? Starts yeah. with a very percussive rhythmic guitar part. And then the drums lay on top of that, yeah. right? The percussion lays on top of that. That yeah. would be an example of the drummer driving of the, of a guitar player driving the bus. Absolutely. Yeah. But there are many things where, where a drummer sets a, sets a vibe and sets a feel. So may, maybe the right know, answer even, if we're really trying like to help. A, a John, you know, we, we often start monkey fist gigs with cherry bomb, the, the John Cougar Mellencamp song. Right. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know why, but we do. It's fine. Uh, guitar drives all the way through that. The guitar can drive all the way through that. Certainly you could have the drums drive all the way through, but, but that song, no problem. Let the guitar drive it. I just, I just play along with the guitar. I'm so maybe what we're it. saying here is that when there's a guitar part that is particularly rhythmic, that implies that the drummer will will defer to the guitar, follow the guitar. But in general, like, you know, if you were to play a blues song, if you were to play, just to say, you know, again, anything that has a groove, you know, if, even in acoustic format, if you're going to play anything that's kind of funky, I would think it would be the drums that would create the rhythm. So that always maybe, sounds empty to me, I, you know, because I, I think about we play we play Pride and Joy sometimes right in the acoustic format. And certainly uh -huh. I can drive that that shuffle groove. No problem. But that song's way better if the guitar player is driving that shuffle groove. It's more full. I've, I've had guitar players in an acoustic format, f like play the the supporting role, not the driving role. And it's quite frankly, awful. It, mm. Like, it, yeah, it, it's like the end of the gig and you're like, oh, man, I'm glad that's over. Like, yeah, I it, it, John and I have been in that boat um, before, you know, with unnamed uh, subs and it's like no you got to drive the bus man you're it like per, but i forget think the point i'm kind of getting here. to is that, yeah. is that there's not a universal process that you lay over every piece of music no, that you play I no, mean, nor, nor is there when you play in a band sure you have to everybody everybody needs to decide who the who the default bus driver is it, again, it's not going to be on a song by song basis. Well, yes, sure. If you want to get that granular, sure. Uh, but but when there's a problem, you need to know, OK, we're going to follow that guy. And and like I said, most of the time and and this is true in the Amanda band. This is true in other acoustic things I've done, too. It's like let the guitar be the be the mm -hmm. bus driver, uh, you know, and, and I and for it's for that reason, I've always called the who an electric acoustic band, right? Because, because it's Townsend that drives the bus again on most of those songs. And you got Mooney just playing, you know, like a maniac around him. Uh, and it worked. I mean, obviously it worked really, really well, but, um, but yeah. Yeah. The who is, a, is a unique example. And that's yeah, for sure. Functional rhythm of the songs comes from the guitar and it's, he's like playing lead drums on that. Right. He's, yeah. he's pretty much so through. He's so he's I, the he's the soloist. He's adding he's adding accompaniment. That's right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I don't think we helped Doctor X here. I think I think uh, we gave him some things to think about, but uh, I don't know if we I don't know if we gave him a prescriptive advice that he can apply to his situation. Uh, well, the prescription would be have the discussion, like and and at the very least know that it is okay for the drums not to be driving the bus on those acoustic gigs. And I, again, you know, my, my feeling about it is these songs should work with just guitar player mm. and a singer. And again, that could be two people or one person. It doesn't matter. Right. But guitar and vocal, does the song work? Yes. Okay. Now as the drummer, what are you bringing to the table? Are you going to get in the way of that? Or are you going to add to it? That's, that's how I approach those things. Like, yeah. Yeah. So so I think it goes back to this golden rule of serve the song. Sometimes finger picking music is will require a different groove underneath it that the drums will drive and, yep. and, and the guitar player will sit on top of it. But like you said, some songs in that format, a busier guitar to take up more space and the drummer follows. It. I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. And I think the, the net prescription for me is what does the song require? There's no right or wrong. There's no hard rules. No. Well, what makes the song sound best? Yeah. What 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 makes it sound good? And then you and can feel best. And then you can take the drummer out of it. And again, in an acoustic thing, when when it really is guitar and and vocals, think the strumming pattern of every song can really throw off a singer. 
Like you need to mm. make sure, and we've learned this in Monkey Fist, even bringing people in that understand they need to drive the bus. Uh, you know, that different strumming pattern. If, if, you know, Johnny O strums differently than, than Jimmy does, which he does it, you know, it took some time to get up to speed with Johnny O so that, so that Johnny D or singer and Johnny O or sometimes guitar player could, you know, lock in with each other. And John would, Johnny D the singer would feel comfortable singing over the guitars drumming pattern. That's different. You know, it's, it's, it's it's all very exposed and that that's ah. kind of the thing with the acoustic thing right is is it by definition exposed so you got to make sure everybody can lock in and and kind of settle into that groove together there you go and, and i would actually add this i i think a lot about this when putting together my even my solo acoustic shows is that what's interesting to me is the variety of sounds and feels that i can emote in this kind of very limited format this limited instrumentation limited you know vocal representation so i pick a certain amount of finger picking songs, a certain amount of strumming songs, a certain amount of altered tuning songs. And try, over the course of a two or three hour gig, try and give people a few um, a few things to listen to. I will say from a guitar player standpoint, over strumming can often get you into amateurish. Mm. Ex, let's just say extended over strumming. Yep. Really busy, really busy. Anything will get annoying after a while, but really busy acoustic strumming. You know, when you're playing cowboy chords and, and you know, just strumming your heart away, you do that three, four, five songs in a row. That can I think that can uh, be a difficult vibe to, to send. You know, I, I, have you ever heard me play acoustically um, fire, Bruce Springsteen's fire? I don't know that I have. So, you know, you can think of even the, the full band song, you know, starts kind of with a bass, you know, yeah. and then it kind of layers these instruments. So I, I have an uh, uh, arrangement that he did acoustically. It's just it's basically power chords right and it's the low end of the instrument and i'll follow that with something that is finger picking and just the the variety of sound seems to be it's pleasing to me i assume it's pleasing to people who are listening to <laughs> well me that just, you can yeah uh, you kind of have to use your own your own barometer yeah. on that stuff but yeah, i would just, that's my right point to this is that over strumming an acoustic guitar can get brash can get cloying can get annoying and so you know if if that's the question is you know i just want to strum my heart out you know, you really got to gauge the audience's reaction and, you know, just be listening to it. But I know that um, when I do duo gigs with other people, especially if they're not real experienced doing solo or duo formats, they, they play in a band, they want to try this stuff out. And I sit with them, the go-to for overcompensating for insecurities about the kind of nakedness of the, of the performance is to overstrum. And, um, you know, anyone learning guitar can strum, right? Not right. anyone can finger pick, not anyone can find, you know, you know, interesting altered chords, can play in, in altered tunings and get different sounds. You know, what you get when you're sitting around a campfire, that sound, that's that's kind of 101. By the time you're performing solo acoustic shows or duo or trio, because hopefully you're at least 201, if not 301 or 401, and you're, you're providing your audience with different sounds, over strumming for extended periods of time, to me, is... Uh, is a kind of a a crutch. Huh. Interesting. So now I see why you have that the 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 the, the why why you subscribe to the concept that that the drummer drives the the rhythm at least some of the time, it, you know, a significant some of the time in yeah. your acoustic cuz it depends like, on the song. For Monkey Fist, I I would we certainly on paper would be running afoul of your definition of over strumming, but it works amazingly well. Um, it, you know, Jimmy, most of the time we have him strumming. And when we have had people in there that, that want to turn it into like, Oh, for this part of this song, I'll start picking. It's like, Oh, well the bottom just fell out, you know? Mm. No, like, and, but monkey fist is not, I mean, I, I don't want to, uh, uh, over categorize anything monkey fist is very much a rockin' acoustic thing. So we kind of yeah. keep things moving, you know, meat and potatoes in terms of keeping it simple uh, in terms of the, the instrumentation and the, and the playing, it doesn't get too busy. It's just like, so kind of like a, a rock unplugged type of thing. Rock unplugged is what monkey fist is. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's, it's not the, um, the, the, the subtleties and nuances of, you know, someone playing uh, uh, acoustic guitar like Monkey Fist is meant to be it, sing along, enjoy, have fun, like engage, not not um, it's yeah, it's rock unplugged. That's exactly the right way to think of it. Yeah, I Got like it. that. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a yeah. bunch of thoughts for Dr. X. Hopefully you that, that will at least give you something to talk about in your band. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I like that word, though, or that term, rock unplugged. That's because if if you're that, then maybe the guitar does drive the, the bus more often than not. Uh, I, you know, and I find that stuff, setting. Yeah. That's what kind of got me back into acoustic music is like the whole MTV unplugged genre and, and the way that that artists reinterpreted their music yeah. unplugged was really interesting to me. And and I am always looking for that type of stuff. I mean, that's where I get a lot of inspirations on YouTube is just finding, you know, different ways uh, to to deliver music that you're used to hearing with a, you know, a plugged in edge. How do you make the song interesting? And, you know, Bruce has been amazing at that. You know, he's he's performed his greatest electric hits in unplugged format and he changes the format all the time. All the time. But all that in, all the time. And that MTV unplugged was really inspiring yeah, stuff. It was. I mean, you just, when, just to hear those great songs just reinterpreted is just so fun. It's a shame there's no more music on MTV anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. All right. Well, that gets us to the end of this episode, I think. Uh, thank you so much for listening, folks. Please do send in your feedback. Thank you to Dr. X uh, for sending that question in that uh, clearly we have a lot to say about these things and we would love to hear from you. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. And, uh, you know, uh, I would I would say no matter how you do it, always be performing, right? It's good advice. I think so. Perhaps the best, perhaps the best advice we could give. I love it. I live it. Uh, same. <laughs> <laughs>